Yeah, of course. Okay, so we are here looking at chapter seven. And of course, all sorts of other fun stuff. Why are you not functioning with me? Come on. Okay, let's pause and stop and see what's going on. Technology is fantastic in the way that it actually can get nothing done too. Oh, there we go. Okay. Fantastic. There we are. Okay. So, one way or another, we'll get this to work. Now, share the screen here. Sorry for wasting your guys' time. Okay. It's recording. Cool. I hope I'll remember to remove all of that nonsense and not waste your time. Or you guys can laugh at my antics. Okay. So, we're talking chapter seven. talking energy and the question that has been actually asked has been about enthalpy and enthalpy is a weird thing and so is energy so is so is existence right anyways energy the very simple definition of energy that you'll typically read in a textbook is the ability to do work Oh, wow. Isn't that helpful? That tells you so much energy. So when you're not feeling like you want to work or if you don't have a job, I guess you don't have any energy, right? You're un if you're unemployed, you don't have the ability to do work, then you have no energy. That's not what they meant by work though. Actually, what is work? Well, work is force exerted over a distance. And what is force? Force is mass times acceleration. Now, acceleration doesn't mean just speeding up. It also means slowing down. Acceleration is purely a change in velocity. Okay. Acceleration is, so acceleration is a change velocity. Why am I telling you all these things? Well, it's good to look at where these things come from. Okay. These aren't things you're going to be tested on, but it's important to understand where these things come from. And also appreciate the fact that a lot of chemistry, especially this component of chemistry, draws from physics. These are absolutely fundamental physics uh, uh, terms. Um, and therefore, you should, I want you to see the interrelationship between the two, okay? So acceleration is a change in velocity. We're gonna keep going with this until we get down to the fundamentals. Velocity is a change in distance over a change in time. Movement with respect to a certain amount of time is velocity, okay? Now I'll say this again, acceleration is a change in velocity with respect to change in time. Force equals mass times acceleration and energy, at least in the form of work, is equal to force times distance. So all of these things are related. All of these things are measurable. All of these things are quantities that you can actually determine. Okay. And if you happen to take a physics class, now you've seen them once or twice. We're not even going to do calculations. 
you've been exposed to that. Okay? And you may have seen these before. Wouldn't surprise me if you saw these in a math class either. They are very applicable uh, equations. Any questions so far? Okay. What I'm trying to convey to you, though, is several things, including the fact that energy, to begin with, is a complex idea. Okay. There are different types of energy. Work is only one of them. There are also things called kinetic energy. And that is the energy essentially of movement. If you were to look at the linguistics of it, that's pretty much what it translates into is the energy of movement. The equation of kinetic energy is one half the mass that's moving times the velocity squared. Again, you don't need to know these equations. The point is just to show you what I'm talking about. Mass moving at a speed is kinetic energy, the energy of movement. Okay. There's also something called potential energy. One way to think about potential energy is stored energy. Um, and in physics, we tend to go with the height of the object uh, multiply, let's see, what is it? Mass, height times, I'm literally blanking on the, on the equation of potential energy right now. And that is embarrassing. It is height times mass times acceleration. Pretty sure that's right. The height that you move the object and the acceleration typically is gravitational acceleration. So the height that you move the object, the mass of that object, and then gravitational acceleration because you've lifted that object from the surface of the planet. And so therefore you're holding it and the energy is stored as if it were accelerating toward the center of the earth. Okay. Again, the point I'm trying to convey to you is we have ways of trying to understand energy by looking at the types of energy. Okay. There are even ways of interconversion between energy and mass. So when we say that mass is conserved and energy is conserved, there are theories that suggest that energy and mass interconvert. That's a crazy idea too. But you do see it occurring. It appears to be occurring at the level of subatomic particles when you look at nuclear physics. Okay. Now, we're not going to go there into that level of detail, but it's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Okay. So, again, what is energy? Energy, we tend to say, I'm repeating myself, I know, but it's the ability to do work. Okay. Heck, one definition of mass, one definition of mass is the ability to resist gravitational acceleration. Now that's a crazy idea too, or it may feel that way. The ability to resist gravitational acceleration, okay? So if energy is the ability to do work, and now we're in chemistry, chemical work, and not just chemical work, but one definition of work can be Essentially, uh, let's see, you do boil it down to it is uh, pressure, uh, pressure external times change in volume, P delta V. Okay. For me personally, equations make sense. They make more sense than the sentences explaining them, because you can look at it. You can look at a symbolic representation of something, and it can explain things in a way that words can be difficult to utilize. Okay. Pressure is even a a difficult thing at first to define. Pressure is force exerted over an area, so not a, a, a 
one dimensional distance, but a two dimensional area. It's force exerted across an area is pressure. Okay. That's why you guys may have heard of units, things like pounds per square inch, which is what we tend to use for uh, tire pressure here in the US, pounds per square inch. Right? Pounds are a type of force. In, and of course, inches squared is area. Okay. Good so far? You guys with me so far? OK. So all of this is coming back to all of these different interconnections. And it's difficult to see them at first. But what I'm trying to convey is we're talking about energy, which is a difficult to grasp concept to begin with. Okay. And now we're talking about chemical work which tends to be something we discuss. There are all sorts of things. I, I don't think the book goes into this, but how many of you guys have taken physics? Anyone taken even like a, a, an overview of physics? High school counts. High school physics counts. Absolutely. Yeah. Or how about physical science? Have you taken physical science? That even has a little bit of physics mixed in there. Okay. If you've ever explored those concepts, then you are familiar with, in general, the idea of E is often used for the internal energy and energy of a system. Have you guys ever heard the term system versus surroundings in scientific courses? We're looking at the system versus the surroundings. Okay. There's a very basic way of defining perspective in physics. And one of the things about physics, and it continues through into chemistry, is that what you're calculating is relative. There's very seldom a time you calculate something that's absolute. What you're looking at is relative. You pick a certain part of the universe that you want to analyze, and you say, this is my system. The system is the part of existence you are studying, and the surroundings are everything else. Okay. Whether it is a single molecule you're talking about as your system, or you're talking about this classroom as your system, or you define the universe as your system. You can define the universe as your system, and whatever else exists outside this universe, which we have no clue about, but if you lived inside a cave your entire life, you might think the universe was your cave, and everything else outside of it was whatever was outside of your universe. Yes, there's a lot of philosophical implications here too. Okay, these these are things that can shatter your mind if you're not careful. The system and the surroundings, though, are the way that you begin to define what you're studying, because you look at energy exchanges either within the system or with the system and its surroundings. Okay, and the internal energy of a system in physics tends to be the most fundamental thing that you study. You study the internal energy of the system. I'm going off the deep, it probably feels like I'm going off the deep end. You guys are going, okay, he's, he's shown up the glass intoxicated. No, I'm not intoxicated. But these concepts require a glance at all of these little pieces because you can't talk about them without the words and the vocabulary associated with them, okay? So, The system essentially is the thing we're interested in, and the surroundings are everything else. There are different types of systems. There's a lot of things to physics that I don't want to delve into. 
E gets defined as the internal energy of whatever you're studying of the system. So we're talking about the energy of the system. The fundamental definition of that becomes work plus heat. Okay. Work, as we've said, can be defined as force times distance. It can also be defined as pressure times change in volume. Heat is often represented with the letter Q. This is heat. That is typically mass. I need to give myself more space here. So Q, meaning heat, is equal to mass times, this is the frustrating part, there's a constant called the specific heat capacity times change in temperature. There's so many things here. Specific heat capacity. T is temperature, delta T is T final minus T initial. There's a lot of things here to unpack. There's a lot. Okay. All of these things I'm trying to mention, though, is these calculations become very complicated when we start talking about when we're looking at different types of systems, a closed system, a open system. Closed systems don't exchange stuff with the surroundings, open systems do. Enthalpy. is a measure of systems adjusted for, we'll, we'll basically say for ease of use, for ease of calculation, okay? Enthalpy literally is a, what we call a state function that exists to make calculations easier. It was created artificially in some ways, you could all say. There are different ways of conceptualizing enthalpy, but the primary reason it was created was for ease of calculation. Now, all of this stuff boils down to the following. In an open system, Enthalpy, conveniently having the letter H, of course, because heat is Q. And all of this makes absolute sense, I'm certain. There are reasons why these letters are chosen, but I, I've already wasted enough time, your guys' time, with the bigger picture things. So enthalpy in a closed system, let's say, is work plus heat plus a new P delta V function. Now what I forgot to correct was it's actually minus P delta V. So work is minus P delta V, which means that enthalpy in an open system comes down to 
So, so in the closed system, what happens is this cancels out the uh, work function. allowing uh, H. Am I Let's not overcomplicate it. Let's just go back to something that's saying that enthalpy exists. To make calculations easier. I want to give you guys a full picture, but I'm realizing I've already overcomplicated. Question. Ah. Okay. Enthalpy is essentially energy. Okay, you can think of enthalpy as being energy, essentially. Okay, there's reasons why it has a different name, et cetera, et cetera, so the calculations, blah, blah, blah. But enthalpy is energy. Okay, specifically, uh, you can think about it as work and heat type energies. Okay, because there's also, of course, um, if you have enthalpy, you've also got, come on, brain. Entropy, that's the word I was looking for. It's gonna be terribly embarrassed. So, okay, so there's enthalpy. There's also entropy is people use disorder and chaos as the explanation of it. This is an inaccuracy. Technically, it's a It's a shortcut of way of trying to explain things. It's a depressing way of looking at it. It's a dark and dismal way of looking at entropy. Entropy doesn't have to be described as chaos and disorder and everything decaying. It doesn't have to be explained that way. But that's how people shortcut it. Let's start with enthalpy. Okay. Enthalpy is energy, especially in, in the types of the types of work as the types of things as work and heat and potential energy as well. When it comes to bonds, you can calculate the enthalpy of potential energy in bonds by looking at uh, how much energy is required to break bonds. And one of the really nice videos that I included on the Canvas site that I really like because it is such an important concept to convey to you guys. I'm about to do on the next slide. Okay. Are you guys with me so far? As well as you can. Okay. Uh, enthalpy can be utilized to calculate. So you can calculate the, the, the bond enthalpy by, look, by thinking about it as potential energy in the bonds by looking at how much energy is required to break bonds. That's an important thing to conceptualize. Let's remind ourselves, bonds form to stabilize and bring atoms 
to a lower energy level. Okay, does that sound familiar to all of you guys? Bonds form because they become they make things more stable. Otherwise, they wouldn't form. There would be no point in forming chemical bonds if they didn't stabilize them and bring things to a lower energy level. Things are driven by bringing things to a lower energy level. Okay, so therefore, bond formation stabilizes. So when we say that energy is stored in bonds, that's actually an inaccurate statement. Energy is not stored in bonds, not really. Okay. It, it is and it isn't, let's put it that way. It is and it isn't stored in bonds. The reason I say it isn't is because bonds exist to stabilize them. And if bonds existed purely to, to store energy, that would actually mean that bonds existed to destabilize them. Because if you're storing energy, you're increasing the energy available in those bonds. And that is not the case. When two things come together and they form a bond, they reach a lower energy level. Okay? So that's an important concept to begin with. That bonds exist to stabilize things. And therefore, a bond is not an inherent storage of energy. And I have to convey that to you guys because it is so often taught in the wrong way. And I'm even guilty of teaching in the wrong way in past semesters. I have not emphasized this enough. I have not made sure that this was clear. I think even early in life, I misunderstood it because it makes, it, it, it makes sense. You go, okay, I light a fire. I light this paper on fire. It's releasing energy spontaneously. Clearly, energy was stored in the paper. And we start to think of everything as being energy storage based upon that. But that doesn't make sense if you think about why would bonds form in the first place. Bonds only form because things become more stable, because energy is actually released in bond formation. When bonds are formed, energy is released. Okay. In general, in general. In general, in general, we can say bond formation releases energy. Now, again, I'm saying in general, we can use bonds to store energy. Absolutely, we can use bonds to store energy. But we do that in relation to bonds. Let me explain this. Okay. You guys good so far? Okay. So if you look at any molecule, something like uh, let's just do something relatively simple. This thing, this is just a three carbon, four hydrogen molecule. So this is C3, H4. You just look at anything relatively straightforward. You look at the bonds, you look at the, the compound. These bonds had to come together and be stable for them to exist for more than a period of time. And we want that to be the case because we don't want the bonds that make up our body to fall apart either. If you're going to spontaneously combust, and believe me, you're not going to. Okay, human spontaneous combustion is not a thing. Okay, no matter what people tell you, human spontaneous combustion is not a thing. There will always be an explanation for why something combusted. There will always be an explanation. But if you look at this molecule. It requires energy to break these bonds. You have to literally pull these things apart, okay? It's like magnets. You bring two magnets close enough to each other, they're gonna stick together, okay? So energy is required to break those bonds. Same thing goes for diatomic oxygen. Diatomic oxygen, reactive certainly, highly reactive, but diatomic oxygen 
exists very stably in the atmosphere as well. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any oxygen available for us to breathe. Oxygen is very stable in the air. It doesn't just react with everything instantaneously, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to breathe. We wouldn't have it available for a long period of time. We'd have to always store it in canisters away from everything else just to be able to breathe. We don't have to. That's not the case, thankfully. So therefore, diatomic oxygen is also stable. You combine these things and you add heat, like a spark, and sure, yeah, they'll react. But there are reasons for that. Okay. And you can't look at these situations independently. What so so let's say these are our reactants. These are our reactants. You can't consider what's going to happen energetically independent of looking at the products. Like I said, when we were talking about energy in general, things are relative to one another. And that includes chemical reactions. Things are relative to one another. There are relationships that exist between reactants and products. That is what we were talking about when you're talking about the enthalpy of these reactions and higher in energy, lower in energy, exothermic versus endothermic. Those are in relation to the energy in the, in the, it found within the bonds of the reactants in comparison to the energy found in the bonds of the products. Okay. So if we look at the products of the reaction, and the reaction we're actually talking about is C3H4 plus O2 that gives us the unbalanced CO2 plus H2O, which is apparently the one that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and yeah, we can balance this thing. We can put a two here, three there. And that gives us uh, two there is six, plus two is eight, so we need a four. That now, now we have balanced reaction. If you look at these products, the enthalpy. of the products bonds, I can tell you from experience, are going to be a lower quantity than the enthalpy of the reactants. Now I know this because of course I've done calculations of combustion reactions so many times that I know that these things are going to be in, in relationship to one another. This is a combustion reaction. You guys are familiar enough with combustion reactions that you know that if something is burning, it's hot. It produces heat, OK? That means heat is released, released. Heat is released, okay? Heat is released. That means the energy of the bonds and the products is lower than the energy in the reactants. Now, does that actually make sense though? Does that make sense to you guys? If it doesn't, please let me know. If that doesn't just snap in place for you. Is there anyone who goes, uh, why? Absolutely. So I'll even write it down. Okay. Let's spell, at least I'll try to write it down correctly too. That's where you are supposed to laugh. I need like little cue cards. Laugh here. Good. At least I got a huh. If heat is released, okay, this means 
the sum of the energy of the bonds in the products is less than the sum of the energy in the reactants. Question. This is true of any reaction. This is true of any reaction. If heat is released, if, the, if you can feel heat release or you can measure heat release, if heat is released, that means the sum of the energy of the bonds and the products is less than the sum of the energy in the bonds, uh, sum of the energy in the bonds of the reactants. Okay. And the reason for that is, where did that heat come from? Where did the, nothing, so if we go to conservation of the basic laws of, of chemistry and physics, conservation of mass, and now we're talking about energy, so conservation of mass, of energy. Conservation of energy, just like the conservation of mass says, conservation of energy says, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, okay? If energy can neither be created nor destroyed, then any sort of heat that appears in front of us had to come from somewhere. Does that make sense? Everything has to come from somewhere. Nothing spontaneously appears. Okay. So, if heat is produced, then it came from chemical bonds. And what we're talking about is we took this thing and we added to it but I think we added four oxygen molecules. I think the balance reaction is four oxygen molecules, if I recall correctly. And yeah, you can literally draw these four oxygen molecules. We did the reaction and we ended up with three CO2. John as quickly as possible and therefore incredibly ugly. And two H2O. And what it literally means is if you were to add up all of the energy found in the bonds on the reactant side and compare it to the energy of the bonds on the reactant side, all of them, all the bonds, all those molecules I've just drawn, the energy would be less on the right-hand side than it would be on the left-hand side. And that energy goes out into the form of the heat that you feel when that stuff burns. And the same is true of any reaction where you feel heat produced, where you measure heat being produced. What is produced as well as these substances is plus 
heat, any exothermic reaction. So definition, Well, let's even go back just a step. Enthalpy of bonds is calculated, for us it's calculated using a table of energies required to break bonds, okay? We utilize a table of energies required to break bonds. And then enthalpy of a molecule is the sum of bond energies in the molecule. These things make sense, but I wanna just build on them real quickly, okay? Enthalpy of bonds is the energy used to break the bonds. The enthalpy of the molecule is the sum of the bond energies in the molecule. Make sense so far? Then I think you guys can see where you get the enthalpy of the reactants. It is the sum of all molecule energies. And yes, you do use coefficients there because you need to sum up all of those molecules in the balanced equation, okay? And the enthalpy of the products is the same exact thing, but for the products rather than the reactants. Make sense so far? Okay, you guys are with me so far. Then, the enthalpy of a reaction is equal to the change in enthalpy, okay? Which therefore would be change in enthalpy will be equal to This is the tricky part. When you look at the table, what form do the values in the table take? So, there's our text. There it is, like I'm looking at the text. Okay, average bond dissociation energies right here, okay? These are the amounts of energy required to be put into a bond. This is where we have to do yet another tangent. Come back to this page even and say, the sign of energy indicates the flow of the energy. Okay, the sign of the energy indicates if it's going into the system or out of the system. Are you putting energy in or out? This is just like your bank account. If you put money into your bank account, it's positive. If you remove money from your bank account, it's negative. That makes sense? So the sign positive means in, I will, Stress this is with respect to enthalpy and negative means out. Stick to just saying enthalpy for now. Okay. You guys with me so far on that? Okay. Therefore, when we look at these energies and you see how all these energies are positive, these are the energies required to break bonds. So they are positive because you have to put in this energy to break the bond, okay? They're positive because they're required, therefore, to break the bond. That makes sense so far? See, it's consistent. If you need to put energy into a system to achieve something, 
You have to put energy in here to break the bond. These bonds don't break spontaneously, they're stable. So you have to put energy in to break them, okay? Good so far? Okay, so bond, and there's a reason why things are spoken in the fashion. Bond dissociation energies are positive because energy is always required to break a bond, okay? Bond dissociation energies are all positive because energy is required to break bonds. So if we're talking in isolation about bond breaking, it's always gonna be a positive value, okay? Rather than going backwards, I'm just gonna to go to the next slide. Okay, you guys with me so far? I'm trying to do this as slow as I can and make sure that it makes sense. So the change in enthalpy for a reaction is going to be the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. Now, this is pretty standard operating procedure. Just like when I showed you temperature is final minus initial, this is products minus reactants, end place minus starting. It's a very common theme in science and in math is final minus initial, last thing minus first. We can actually do this calculation for that reaction I just showed you, okay? Looking at those molecules, we've got our products are four, no, it's not four, it's three, here we go. I'll just write it out, ready? It is three CO2 plus two H2O, question. Reactants versus products? Reactants minus products? Ah, no, you're right. Yes, and that, yes, 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 yes. My apologies, you're right. As much as I wanna make this easy, this is, there's a reason for that. The reason for that is, okay. You can do this calculation either with bond dissociation energies or bond formation energies. That's the problem, okay? Done with bond formation, it is absolutely product minus reactor. Bond formation energies are negative. Bond formation energies, if bond dissociation energies are energies required to break bonds, then bond formation energies are the, the energy released as bonds form. The opposite process. If it requires energy to break bonds, then when those bonds form, that is energy released. Does that make sense? Okay. You can see the, the, uh, the cyclical nature of these things. Right? So bond formation works with these calculations like this because we end up with negative energy. Problem therefore is when you do these with bond dissociation, you actually have to do this with H of the reactants minus each of the products. You actually have to do it that way. And that's true. Pardon? We are.
So. Yeah. Um, the problem with this equation will become clear. So let's just do this. Uh, let's do an example, okay? Uh, which was C three H five plus O two three CO two plus H four. Sorry, H four. Uh, Come on, go away, go away, go away. And it should be a four there. Okay, so H of the reactants. You look at our table and looking at this table, You can make use of these values. You guys will have these values on the exam. I will. You do not need to memorize these. First and foremost, that should be clear. You do not need to memorize. Okay. These values, if you need them, will be provided to you. Okay. And very likely, you'll need them because you'll see homework problems where you're doing exactly these calculations. Okay. So we've got a carbon-carbon double bond, right there, 391 kilojoules per mole. There are two times 391 kilojoules per mole, uh, which is on the order of uh, six, seven, 82 kilojoules per mole. So that's the carbon, carbon double bond. And then we've got four carbon hydrogen bonds. So that is four carbon hydrogen bonds comes down to 413. So that's four times four, 113 kilojoules per mole, which is on the order of two, four, five, and 1,652. And then finally, we've got four times uh, the oxygen, oxygen double bond. The oxygen, oxygen double bond is 201. 201 times four, that's kilojoules per mole, which is then on the order of 408. Then we add these things together, do a summation. 224 is eight, eight five is 33, get one. I know it's lots of fun watching me do math. Eight and six is 14 plus eight is 22, carry the two, gives us 3,283, I believe, kilojoules per mole. Okay, you guys with me so far? Okay, so that's for the reactants. Do the enthalpy of the products. And yes, I'm doing this very fast, I know. I do apologize, but uh, I'm so far behind what I wanted to convey to you guys already. and. Uh, Time is burning fast. There are three of the CO2, which is a carbon, carbon double bond on both sides. So there are two carbon, carbon, oxygen double, not carbon, carbon, sorry, carbon, oxygen double bonds, 200, two times 200 kilojoules per mole. There's two of those in the carbon dioxide. There's three of those total in the reaction. That is going to be uh, four, so that's 1,200. And then we've got H2O. There are two of those, and there are two oxygen hydrogen bonds. So that's two times two times an oxygen hydrogen single bond right there. If I said double, that's an embarrassment. Always going to be oxygen single bond. Or, uh, sorry, hydrogen. It's always going to have single bonds. Oxygen hydrogen single bond, 467. So 467 essentially times four uh, is going to be eight. It's going to be another eight. And it's finally going to be 
We're saying it's reactants minus products, right? That's what I've got here in my study guide. That is what the uh, book says. I think this agrees with the book. Did I make a mistake somewhere? Okay, so you're probably sitting there going, okay, three, two, three, eight, minus three, oh, eight, eight. That's going to give us a uh, something on the order of. This is where I wish I'd pulled out my calculator. And I don't want you guys watching me use my calculator. So uh, all of that aside, let's say this is on the order of 770. Sorry? 150, thank you. That sounds a lot more accurate. 150 kilos. I, the, what the real mistake that was made is the calculation, okay? So this, all of this here, this should not have been 200 kilojoules per mole. This should have been 799 kilojoules per mole, which means six times 800 is more along the lines of, uh, let's see, six times 800 is more along the lines of, oh, I don't know, I'd say 4,800, right? 4,800 is something very different here. This brings us to eight, eight, uh, a six, and a six. We end up with 6,688, okay? So then when you do three, two, three, eight, minus 6,688, when you do that, all of a sudden you get minus, oh, I don't know, zero, something on the orders of rough, very roughly, negative 3,000 kilojoules per mole, okay? So long story short, I was walking myself in circles going, why the heck didn't this calculation work? Calculation didn't work because you used the wrong numbers, okay? Use the wrong numbers, you'll get the wrong result, and then you'll try to explain away the wrong result. The reality is, this thing is 3,000 negative kilojoules per mole, okay? From delta H reaction equals H reactants minus H products. That is completely right. And we have just proven that when you actually do the calculation correctly, okay? I knew something was nagging in the back of my head going, there's something wrong here. Carbon dioxide is special. The bond energy in the those oxygen oxygen double bonds is special. If you stick two oxygens that close to each other on a carbon, it's going to be a different situation. Okay. There is the answer. So delta H of reaction that is uh, reaction that is less than zero, meaning that it's negative, we define as exo thermic, meaning energy released, which means energy of the products is less than the reactants. That's what that, all that means, okay? If you do this for something opposite, like a synthesis, reaction, if you did the calculation, if you took H2 plus O2 and you got H2O, 
Uh, that's a bad example. That's a really, really bad example. Let's not do the example where it's actually a weird one. Okay. A synthesis reaction, though, usually where you combine stuff. No, let's not say synthesis reaction. All of these statements, I'm trying to make too many too quickly. Let us just say reaction where the, ener the enthalpy of the products is greater than the energy of the reactants. For example, CO2 plus H2O, six and six, giving you C6, H12O6 plus, I think it's six O2 if I recall correctly. This is a synthesis reaction, the synthesis of glucose. You're taking carbon dioxide and water and making glucose from it, which is what plants do, which is what photosynthesis in general is all about. This, the reactants of, are lower in energy than the products. You are storing energy in bonds. So yes, energy can be stored in bonds when you take this and you add energy to it, usually in the form of light. And light is just a type of energy, just like heat. This is an endothermic reaction where the delta H of reaction is greater than zero because you are storing light energy in the form of chemical bonds. The bonds themselves can store energy relative to the things that were combined, but energy storage is relative to the reactants. The energy storage is relative to the energy of the energy found in the bonds of the reactants. Energy storage, when people say energy is stored in bonds, they are making a comparison between the energy of the bonds and the reactants and the energy of the bonds and the products. Okay. So I'll make that statement and then we're going to get this lab going. Okay. Energy storage means energy in the bonds of the reactants is greater than the energy and the bonds of the products. Okay, that's all energy storage can mean because inherently the bonds themselves of just stuff is not storing energy by themselves. It must be seen as relative to something else. Energy is released when the energy of the products is less than the energy of the other reactants. Energy released means energy in the bonds of the reactants is now, oh, I got this bloody backwards. The reactants is less than the products. The reactants is greater than product bond energy. There we go. This is what happens when I try to delve into something in too much depth without preparation ahead of time and, and no sleep. The reality is what I want you guys to get from this bonds don't mean by themselves energy storage. It is relative to products compared to reactants. Is the energy of the reactants lower than the energy of the products or higher than the energy of the products? If it is higher than the energy of the products, that's a downhill release of energy. If the energy in the bonds of the reactants is lower than the energy of the bonds in the products, that means energy has been stored. It's an uphill storage of energy, pushing energy into the bonds that are formed. Okay, But bond storage, bond release is all about relative comparison. Does that make sense? All about relativistic comparison between bonds in the reactants and bonds in the product. And that's why that video is on the Canvas site. That's why I keep reemphasizing that in this battle. Okay, 
Uh, let's look at the lab real quickly. I just want to give you guys uh, a rundown of what should happen tonight. So uh, this lab is a lot like, okay, shares some similarities with the last lab we just did, okay? You're going to use a crucible. You're going to put it over a flame. And yes, please feel free to ask me for help lighting the flame. I'm very happy to do so. Uh, let's make sure no one gets burned. Okay, no one got burned last class. No one needs to get burned this class. Okay. You guys can work in big groups too. I'm happy to have you guys work in big groups if you want to. Uh, just try to do this all once. Uh, this set of things I'm just about to explain to you. Do not try to start this lab over. It, it, it just would be miserable. So what you're going to do is, one, you're going to get the weight of the crucible plus the lid, just like you did last time. Okay, empty crucible plus lid. Then weight of crucible, lid, and the sodium hydrogen carbonate. Okay. Then you're going to heat this for roughly five to 10 minutes, then cool for five to 10 minutes, five, get the weight of crucible, lid, and the chemical inside, okay? You're then going to Repeat this uh, at least twice more. What you're looking for is a change in weight between heatings of less than 0 0.05 uh, grams. So you're going to weigh it on the analytical balance, and you're going to compare the two weights that you got from the first heating uh, change to the second heating change. Look at those two. If after the first heating cycle and the second heating cycle, you see no change, you see a change of less than 0.05, you can stop there. But I'd like, so that means you only need to theoretically heat it twice. Okay. So you should at least repeat this one time, consider repeating it twice if you need to. Does that make sense? So you're going to weigh it, and, and we're doing mass by difference. You have to do mass by difference. There's no other way to do this. Okay, we're Doing mass by difference. No way around it. Okay. Get your weight of your crucible and lid, then put the chemical inside, get the mass of the total, calculate the difference, then heat it, cool it, Get the mass of the total, get the change in, get the mass of just the compound inside, and look, compare the two side by side. Then do one more heating cycle at least, okay, and compare the two heating cycle mass change, two masses. If they haven't changed by very much, we can call it a night. If not, do it one more time. Okay, sound good? Okay, final thing. So if you look at page 92, weight of crucible and lid. Weight of crucible lid and compound, weight of the compound, weight of crucible lid and solid residue. So that's after, so step three is the weight of your first heating cycle, okay? Step four is now, so steps, uh, sorry, no, sorry, my apologies. Step three, step three is before you've heated anything, okay? Step three is before you've heated anything. That's the weight of your sodium hydrogen carbonate before heating. Step four is the weight of everything after you've heated it once. Step five is the weight of your, uh, whatever's left inside the crucible after heating once. Step six is the second weight of everything after your second heating cycle. Step seven is after you've subtracted off the weight of the crucible and the lid. Step eight, is if you need to do a 
third heating cycle. Okay. Now, finally, sodium, hydrogen carbonate, pretty sure this is in the thing, but it decays into, because this is a decomposition reaction, into sodium carbonate plus H2O, gas, solid, solid, plus CO2, gas, and what you end up with is A2 here, and that should do it. Actually, no, you don't even need a two there. Apologies, don't need the two there. This is a balanced equation. Yes, indeedy. Perfect. So I'm showing you this because what's happening is the mass is going to decrease because these two things are escaping into the room as gases. You are losing mass in the scale, and that should be expected. If your mass increases, call it a day. Okay. The mass has increased, something's really gone wrong. That's not possible. Okay. And that's it. All right, let's get to work. Remember, goggles need to be shut. Question? I will provide you the data right now. I'm going to send that email that out right now. Okay, so let's get started. You guys work in a timely fashion, work in as large groups as you want to, at least have a minimum of four groups. Yes. Yes, give me one second. Absolutely, yeah, if you give me one second uh, to just close out a few things.